Then he goes back to Haas, back to Hanover, and he says, I've done, completed the job. And Haas said, you've done a great job, my boy, but unfortunately there's, there's no, no work the office is full. But because you're such a great ar young architect, I've given you a reference to here, Opla. And so he goes to work for Opla. And that only lasted three months. So that he was unemployed. He was, had all these qualifications, and he wanted to practice architecture. So he decided between Canada or Australia, he's going to leave. And so he left and he came to Australia. And he arrived in 1876 in Adelaide, which is where German immigrants tended to go. He came on the city of Paris boat. And he was really just had a book knowledge of English, no money. And uh, so that's 1876. And eventually, he worked his way around the coast. He even went to Tasmania. Uh, uh, Victoria, and he had a short stint in Sydney, and I think he may have worked with uh, one of the, um, oh, Blacker, so that's the memory, mm -hmm. uh, Blacker, and, uh, but then eventually he arrives in um, Maitland in 1881, and he didn't last in Maitland because there was a pretty good architect there, William Pender, or John Pender. So he then finishes up in Newcastle in 1882. And he puts his notice in the paper, you know, international architect with all these qualifications. And uh, so uh, he, that's when he started in 1882 and he was here in Newcastle till 1910. Um, he, uh, you know, in that period of time, he did over 200 buildings. buildings. And virtually he did them himself. He did the drawings and the and the specifications and the contract admin. And he, so he was a pretty busy man. Now let me see where I am in my, I'm still on my first car. But <laughs> <laughs> my God. <laughs> so that's, um, that was a great card. <laughs> so I can't see now. Oh well, so let me, just quickly, he, um, he, so he, he built up a reputation, and to, to the extent that in 1888, I mean, he's a German in a sort of British colony, and that, you know, that's not easy. And, uh, but in 1888, in the Morrison book of notable figures in New South Wales, he was listed as a notable figure. He, um, he had trouble, uh, mainly because of his, uh, his fanaticism about his architecture. He, he, he wanted perfection in anything he did. Um, so he, um, I, I won't deal with his buildings just yet. He, um, he so he spent, he, saw, he said New South Wales was the best place in the world. He, he never regretted coming to Australia. He, in 19, 1907, after years of hard work, and he, in round about uh, 1903 or four, he took in a partner that was Castledon, so the firm became Menkins and Castleton. And he was quite boastful. He said, you know, my reputation is such that uh, I was able to sell my interest in my practice to Mr. Castleton for something like £530, which is probably a lot of money in those days. And he boasted, said, Mr. Mr. Castleton standing on my shoulders will be able to reap the benefit of my great work, <laughs> worse to that effect. So he goes on a world trip and he went... He was away for about 12 months in 1907, and he went everywhere, everywhere around the world, to China, to Japan, to Americas. He went, he went to see the Pope, and it wasn't the current Pope. And, <laughs> and, and he had witnessed things in Vienna. He, went to, he liked the good life. And he, when he was going back to Germany, he, uh, he said to his mother he wouldn't stay with her because he was now an old growl, and he needed his company. He wanted warmth of a hotel room <laughs> He's, oh. and he thought his mother wouldn't be able to, he didn't want to impose upon his mother, he loved his mother he, his correspondence was always with his mother because his father never spoke to him again, when he left Germany in uh, 1876 he never, his father disowned him, he, so he, he had no but he, he corresponded with his mother and I have all those sort of letters and um, what was the point I was going to make 
Oh yes, he liked his comfort. He wanted to stay in the best hotels, and uh, but he he was also worried that the the Germans would arrest him because he had skipped uh, conscription. So he he he, he wrote to his brother-in-law and he said, "Look, I'll only co I'll come to the border, and you'll have to tell me whether it's safe to cross over because I don't want to get put in into jail." But he said, "Those bloody rotten Germans!" He said, "They charged me." <laughs> They made him pay a fine. I, I can't remember the amount, but he said they were. He swore and he said they were. <laughs> anyway, that in was uh, here. That, another one of the letters which I treasure is he's writing to his mother, and he's talking about the revolting Hereros in uh, Africa, and he says, "Mother, whatever reports come to you about the atrocities of the Hereros, they're nothing compared to what the white man does to them." And he said, uh, the Belgians are pigs and your general thriller is a baboon or something. <laughs> well, the, but he was very antagonistic to what the, the white man was doing in Africa yeah, at that time. So let's see, I'm on the card two now, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I want to talk on card three that, about his architecture. I mean, basically, his work falls into two distinct phases, what I call the decorative phase, which is, this is the, the uh, not the apogee of, uh, of that period. That's the decorative style, which is the buildings like the Earth Gill and Bond store, uh, St Andrews, the Baptist Tabernacle, along with the Institute, the, the decorative buildings. He, and then the, the second period is what I call the warehouse and commercial period, when he, this is from the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, where his clients were more interested in the commerce and the, having buildings which were sturdy and able to take the new uh, conditions of the 20th, 20th century. So, but in between, so he's got those two periods, the decorative and then the, the commercial warehouse. And so this building represents probably the best of the decorative period and the Cohen warehouse is probably the best of the commercial uh, warehouse periods. But strangely enough, and I, I started this rumour, and I think Keith quoted it back to me once, I said that in 1875, the Sisters of Mercy came from, from Ireland to Australia, and they were on the same ship as Minkins. And as a, as a result of that, he got to know Sister Mary Stanislaw, who was the mother superior. But I mean, he didn't, they weren't on the same ship. That's a lie. But nevertheless, for some reason, they, Menkins, who was a Lutheran, became the architect for the Catholic Church. And the Sisters of Mercy were really great clients of his. And um, it's strange that Sister Mary Stanilow, she, um, Menkins was there in the beginning of the development of the convent. And most of the buildings at, at Singleton are by Menkins, the tower and the chapel. No, the chapel wasn't by Menkins, but a lot of the buildings. And so there was a sort of a 17 year period where Menkins was working for the sisters and the Catholic Church. And ironically, the Menkins died on the 10th of March, 1910, and Sister Mary Stanilow died on the 12th of March, 1910. So their journey starts together in Europe. They come to the Hunter Valley, they achieve their, their goals, and they decide, well, if he's gone, I'm going as well. <laughs> So that was, that's quite interesting. I mean, these things happen, you know, the Oldenburg, Newcastle, the Hunt, the Hunter. Mm. I mean, it does, you can make good stories out of these. Mm. <laughs> <don't you>? mm. <laughs> anyway, so that's the, um, he, with the convents, he did convents in Gunnada, he did one in Brankston, he did the one in Hamilton, he did the Singleton. He did lot, uh, the church at Casillas, uh, one at Wallenby. Um, he did work. He did, he did the monastery at, at Mayfield. So he did a lot of work with the Catholic Church, even uh, to the point where, in his will, he left money to the, the Sisters of Mercy. He left most of his money to his mother. She outlived him because he was only 54 when he died. Mm -hmm. 50. Um, anyway, so he also did um, work in Alverston in Tasmania. So let's come to the Woods Chambers. I'm up to 
Number four. How am I going for time? What? Very good. I'll oh, see for another ten minutes. Number ten. Oh, no. oh Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. And then there'll be questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more, more. Let me t let me talk about Woods Chambers. I mean, this was Menken's won a competition for the design of Newcastle Town Hall. And this is typical of architectural competitions. He won that in 1891. And he, there were, if anyone was at the Art Gallery today, there was uh, uh, Kerry Clare, who's the architect for the Art Gallery. And she was saying that they did the uh, Goma uh, building in Brisbane. And she said it was a, so they won the competition and it was anonymous. So no one knows who the entries are, except you can pick the style, can't you, Patty? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyway, so he won the competition for the town hall and it was to be on the, ax the city axis, Dangas axis, and it was to be uh, where, what, well, I'm talking about the Strand, see, that probably people don't know where the Strand was, but it was where about where the Strand was. And it, the town hall was on top and underneath was the market, market buildings, which was a good, good idea, a combination of commercial and mm -hmm. city. But the trade... In those days, the traders came, there was a wharf down at the end of probably, um, what's the, anyway, that street, which is the Axis, Stanger's Axis, and the traders would come from the, the Hunter Valley and they would trade at the wharf. And so the commercial interest said, well, you know, if we move back, we might lose our trade, so it was never built. So he was disappointed, so he must, in 1892, Joseph Wood comes along and says, I want this enterprise, I want... I want office space and I want auction rooms. So Mencken's really put his heart and soul into this building. And uh, it, to the extent that uh, when it was finished, he decided this was the place to run his practice. It was um, had lots of innovation. I mean, apart from the beauty of the building, I mean, it's very much sort of a picturesque Queen Anne style. So when you, and when you go to Oldenburg and you look at the buildings, you see these buildings, this type of Baroque sort of undulated facade. I mean, the detail on this building, you, if you look at what we call the Oriole windows, this one here, underneath it, there's a sort of corbling in it. At the keystone or the base is there Atlas on one side and Hercules on the other. And then up at the top is Commerce in holding the globe. And the top of each window there's, or, uh, there's a series of, I don't know whether they're princesses, but there's figures. I mean, the detailing is beautiful. So the exterior is wonderful. Then the interior, I mean, he, uh, he, he departed to a certain extent, you know, an architect of the 19th century believed in symmetry. This building is not symmetrical, which if you look, you'll see that uh, he was a functionalist to the extent that one door, which was a, a pedestrian door, is single, and the other door is a double door because that's where the barrels were rolled in. Up there, you were, there was also, he put a glass roof in, which was an innovation. And the, then he also used carry pine on the, on the ceilings. And he, really a wonderful innovation, he put lead, perhaps I don't know whether it's still there, in the floor mm -hmm. to deaden the sound between yeah. the upper and lower floors. So, I mean, it was an innovation, and it was said to be the finest building in, in the, the colony at, at its time. Anyway, I mean, that's hyperbole. I mean, got Giants of Woods was promoting it. He didn't have to promote it too hard because he had Menkins got in straight away. Menkins took the job. Um, with the story of Woods Chambers is interesting because, you know, it was built by Joseph Woods for auction rooms at the back. There was really two buildings. That space in between has been filled in. And uh, so there was the auction room at the back and the office space here. And uh, over the years, in, in um, 1926, William Longworth, who was a, a prosperous businessman and philanthropic soul, he acquired the building and he made it into a mini cultural centre. And it was for the Australian Society of Patriots, the Daily Branch. And in this building they had a library, they had uh, a museum, they had uh, music recitals, because Mr. Wood was uh, president of the uh, Lieder Tafel, which is probably how Menkins met Woods at some stage, because Menkins was interested in music, so that was a leader group, and they, so that was Joseph Wood 
obviously hadn't thought of those issues. But so Longworth bought the building and made it into this uh, into this the Longworth Institute. Mm -hmm. what, year, what year? 1926. So the, between the two world wars, the Australian Society of Patriots was strong, mm. and it was all things Australiana were promoted in, in this sort of place with that group. Um, so then, oh, there's a plaque on the front. I don't know whether it's still there, but it it says that this was the landing spot for Lieutenant Shortland, but that's not true. <laughs> but the, there's a plaque on the building which says that's where the landing point was. Um, then, um, so then after the Second World War, this became the club, for, the building for the Air Force Club mm -hmm. and the Newcastle East residents. So, and that must have been at some stage, and I don't know when this occurred, but they, they lift the, the original auction room was single story, but now it's two stories. And I don't know when that was done, mm -hmm. but it must have been between 1926 and the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So the Air Force Club became de facto owners. There was a one trustee remaining from the Longworth Institute, and that's an interesting connection, again, that his name was Walt Chandler, but who'd been previously, or may still have been, the manager of the Cohen Warehouse <coughs> building. So there was a link there between the, the Longworth Institute and the, and the, the Cohen Warehouse. Mm -hmm. At that time, when the, the, Air, the Air Force chaps were getting very old, and so the, there was no there was really no mandate for the building. So the building went to the equity court. Tony Enright, who was a solicitor from Maitland and a, I think a strong member of the, the National Trust, he tried to reactivate uh, the trust, but wasn't successful. And so the, uh, the equity court said the building goes back to the Longworth family, who had given it to, to the people of Newcastle. The Longworth family then sold it, and it was bought by a fellow called Paul McCloskey. And Paul McCloskey bought it because his wife, her name was, her surname was Thompson, but I can't remember her first name. She lived in Newcastle East, and she had a love affair with the building, so she convinced her husband, who was a Sydney man, he was in a business called Laser Vision, that, to buy this building. And then we were engaged to make it into a uh, function centre. But that really never got off the off the ground. The the, the uh, stair was put in, and uh, there was restoration work took place. And also after the after the earthquake, there was damage done, so there was repair work done to the front. Mm. And I, I recall that um, back in when Joy Cummings was Lord Mayor. What was that? What year was that, Keith? Keith. He's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I approached Joey Cummings. We had, we had the exhibition in 1978, and it was probably about 1974 or 72 that I approached Joey. You weren't born then. No. Hmm? Oh, you weren't born then. You were not that young, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Makes us feel old, right? <laughs> it started in 74, it me. Okay. So, anyway, so there were discussions with. We, we did the exhibition, which started the Menken's Revival, that was an exhibition in 1978, which went to Germany, went to the National Trust in Sydney. And the idea was that why it would be great if we could acquire this building, because it had been given originally as a cultural centre to become a sort of a permanent architectural museum for the works of architects, and notably Menken's, but that didn't happen. But we did, we got a grant of 50,000 from the Heritage Council to do some urgent repairs on the front because, you know, after hundreds of, over a hundred years that the building was needing repairs. Mm -hmm. And so, so anyway, Paul McCloskey bought it and uh, work was done and then subsequently I think he sold it and, and we're, here we are today. But, it, you know, the history of the building is, is fantastic and it's a, it's a, it is a treasure. Um, the next bit I've got, I'm up to number six. You must miss one. I've got to go back. No, that'll do. Yeah, so Menken's uh, did try marriage. I mean, he was a confirmed bachelor. And he, I mean, his work, his work was his life. And so he married Maggie Downey, who was a, a widowed Catholic lady. And they set up a house in Beaumont Street, Hamilton, and it lasted for five months. <laughs> <laughs> you can 
imagine marrying this bloody German? I mean, <laughs> with his top hat and his wing. Anyway, so that only lasted five months. And then there was a notice in the paper about the furniture being auctioned off. <laughs> <laughs> and his top hat as well, I think. Anyway, so they were divorced in uh, 1890. So, so he went back to his... He lived at the Great Northern Hotel. And consequently, I mean, the, no man is perfect. He died of cirrhosis of the liver. And he also, in 1895, he went to jail. And just before he went to jail, his state was sequestered because he'd borrowed 40 pounds from William Rouse. I think it was William Rouse. It was a, it was a bet on the Caulfield Cup. <laughs> The horse is still running, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, he, he was a gambler. And he, he like, well, if you're living at the Great Northern Hotel, what else can you do? His best pal was his dog. He had this dog, Mick. He was a way Marana. And it, I think you've got the photograph, haven't you, Keith? Down here. Yeah. I mean, it, a, there's this wonderful, wonderful photograph of Meekins and his dog. Yeah. It was taken at the Charleston Studios, which is, used to be Lowe's building near D David Jones. It's in the foyer of Mencken's apartment. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, Menk Menkins, when he went on his world trip, the only thing that he was worried about, what am I going to do with my dog? So his, his lawyer, Mr O'Sullivan, took the dog <laughs> and looked after Mick. <laughs> and, I mean, the thing about Mick, he, was, he lived at the Greymont Hotel yeah. as well, and he disdained any ordinary food. He wanted partridge and poultry. <laughs> That's what he said. My dog is very particular. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with him. <laughs> so that was, his dog was, his dog was probably worse than his wife. <laughs> anyway, so he goes to jail, but he went to jail on a matter of principle. I mean, he was, um, I don't, it was Woods, the uh, Jasmine House which was a Woods uh, house, and he was designed the outbuildings, and there's a, there's a tower, and he put lightning inductors on it. And again, this is typical, there was a smart electrical contractor came from Sydney, and he tried to hoodwink Meekins by putting in silver instead of platinum electrodes on the lightning conductor. So Meekins told him he was a fraud. Take those things down and take them back to Sydney. Anyway, Mr Hyde, Hydesbury, he, that's not quite the name, it's something like that. He said, that's defamation. So he, he sued Meekins and the, the jury couldn't find, couldn't reach a decision. The judge said, you've got to go back. I'm locking you up till you do. So anyway, they found the plaintiff, but it was such a minor offence that they charged Meekins, fined him 40, 40 shillings. Meekins refused to pay. As a matter of principle, he, so he went to jail for 12 months. Oh. I mean, imagine Eddie O'P. What was he? Jeez, he'd be there too. For all of ten. Anyway, a wallet. Um, but the dog comes after that. No, well, no, he must have, the dog must have come. Well, no, he didn't have the dog there. He couldn't. Well, they looked up. He was incarcerated in Dar Darlinghurst, and then because he had powerful friends, they took him to Maitland, and he set up practice in, in the jail. I mean, he was smart. <laughs> <laughs> the fact was, there was a depression. You know, in the early 90s, there was a depression, and so Meekins had his office in Maitland Jail. <laughs> and it was true because, I mean, four months after he got out, one of his he did a. Um, building for A.A. Danga, which is where Beaver Falls used to be. And this building was something like four storeys, massive warehouse, but it was going to be a Cohen. And there was a hotel, so it was a hotel and warehouse building. And that was built in 1897. I mean, his drawings were complete and went to 10 and was built. And um, it's interesting that uh, that building, which was massive, and it's not, it wasn't one of his best buildings because there was no connection between the they were joined, but the hotel was one style and the warehouse was another. And they, But as Patty and I know, you know, you've got to be a functionalist architect. If you're designing a hotel, that's different to a warehouse. Therefore, it should have a different sort of appearance. So perhaps he was thinking ahead of the functionalist period of architects in the 20th century. That building was destroyed by fire in 1907. 
and um, that was replaced. They built another one in which the only decoration, if you're, it's probably still there, there was a water tower. In the, in the early days, Newcastle was a city of blazes, and it was difficult to put them out because they were storing things like wool, and so there was this tan, and the build, they were timber construction, although Weinbach never burned. Um, and so there were all these blazes. So with, when they rebuilt the, the, main, uh, the, um, the Danga building, they put a water tower on top, and it's got it had it's got fancy decoration, conceals the the, uh, the the water tower. So that was burnt down. Then there was another fire up um, in Newcastle East, where the John Bull um, warehouse was. It burnt down, and that was a calm warehouse. So Menken's that burnt down in 1901 or thereabouts. Menken's was commissioned to design a new warehouse for Cohen. And that's the Cohen warehouse in Bolton Street. Now, this, when Menkins was in jail, as well as doing his uh, architecture work, he was reading magazines because architecture was changing. We were, you know, the Victorian age was where, we, what we call eclecticism, where the styles, if you were doing a church, had to be Gothic. If you were doing a bank, it would have to be classical Greek. So there were the, and then there was no, no link between function structure and the architectural expression. That changed it, you know, in Chicago and places like that and Amsterdam, the <coughs> architecture were beginning to recognise that they needed to change the way they approached architecture. So Menken's obviously read a little bit about that and so the Cohen Warehouse in 1901 is what we call a transitional building. If you look at it, and it's still there, thank God, um, it's, it's got geometric design to it and it's it's a masterpiece in brickwork. The brickwork is absolutely fabulous. And there's a composition, but there's no, none of the acanthus leaves or any of the applied decoration. So that building is a transitional building. And, and I'll just quickly go on to that now, because when, when that building was finished, that was for the Cohen. And <coughs> the difficulty was that he was stripping Minkins was stripping the decoration off the front and that, that was a concession to the commercial age. I mean, the, it's a, also a question of money. I mean, to do the, the fancy decoration costs money and the, the building entrepreneurs like uh, Cohen and Danger and Woods were wanting more functional buildings. So, But inside is Minkins, because of his training as in these building schools back in the 1870s, he had knowledge of construction. In many ways, the, the construction within the Cohen warehouse was more interesting <coughs> than the facade, because he, he what we call story post construction, had iron bark posts, which were you know, 300 by 300, and then they bolsters the top and great big beams, and then the special connections. And you know that's something like five stories that was built, uh, and I mean they didn't have the lifting cranes that we have today, so anyway, it's quite amazing structure, which Menkins was a master of, he knew how to do that. What's the name? So what happened was that in around about 1970, probably 1974, the, the Cullen Warehouse was no longer, because of the <coughs> difficulty of getting, and this happened all over the world, Warehouses were in the middle of cities. Traffic developed and you couldn't get access, easy access with trucks and things to the warehouses. So warehouses were now being either demolished or adapted. And so in 1974, Nick Raptos bought the uh, Cotton Warehouse and started to demolish. Well, I'm not sure whether, Keith, you weren't born then, were you, at that time you just said? <laughs> So we, there was a campaign man, mounted, Les Reedon, myself, and uh, I, we had a, a friend at court, Peter Moffat, who was an advisor to Paul Lander. Paul Lander was the Minister for um, local, local Government and the Environment, and, and this is 1975 now. Paul Lander came to Newcastle and he recognised the importance of the building after we put the case to him, and so he put a 
a stop order on the demolition, which was in many ways illegal. He, he didn't have the right to do that, and it could have been put in court. But at that time, New South Wales government was trying to implement the Heritage Act of 1976. And so the, the work stopped on the demolition, which meant that the interior had been removed virtually, but we kept, we had the northern side and the, the eastern side. And so the bulk of the building was still there. What happened then was the, um, there was a proposal to build a parking station down on Boat Harbour. And we were able to convince the council that, that why don't we make the Menken's, Menken's warehouse into a car park and, and, uh, and forego the need to have a car park on the harbour, which would have been terrible. And uh, the, what the council said, what's it cost to keep the, the, uh, the facade and that there in place? Well, look, I don't know where we got the figure, but we told them $80,000. Anyway, so the state government gave $80,000 to the council. They bought the building and then they had a competition to design a car park. Yes, who won the competition? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, we did the right thing. We, we stepped... <laughs> this is where our architect's conscience come in. We, so we're able to... I mean, the, the Where does Eddie O'B come into all this? <laughs> <laughs> he, wasn't, he was the same age as Pete. <laughs> I mean, what we did, there was, it was an interesting problem because the Newcastle East School, which was a building by Willie, Willie Kemp, I think, and uh, out my kids were going there, and this proposal was that the envelope was such that we're going to cast a shadow on the school. So what, in the design, we stepped the building down, so you have the bulk of the building, and then it stepped down as it went towards the south. And anyway, so the building was saved.